All right, welcome to the Urology Health Podcast. I'm here with Dr. Scott Egner. Scott, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself, first of all, and what you do. Yeah, I'm a urologic oncologist at the University of Chicago. I help direct our prostate cancer program. I basically take care of people that are uh, being screened or diagnosed with urologic cancers, most commonly prostate cancer. Start out with the absolute basics. What is a prostate? Yeah, it's a great question and uh, one I get all the time in the clinic. So a prostate is an organ deep down in the pelvis of only men, and its only known function is to help thin out the ejaculate of men. And other than that, it's best known for all the problems it causes. So it causes infections, inflammation, it gets large and causes problems with urination, and then it obviously can cause cancer as well. We know prostate cancer is typically one of the most common cancers in men, and, and how is it diagnosed? Yeah, so historically, about 30 years ago, the way guys typically found out they had prostate cancers, they'd show up to the doctor with bone pain, back pain, and unfortunately, the prostate cancer had spread elsewhere in their body, and it wasn't curable. In the late 80s, early 90s, this blood test, PSA, rolled around, and the whole concept was we had an opportunity to diagnose these prostate cancers earlier. So nowadays, in 2017, the most common way, at least in the United States, that men are diagnosed with prostate cancer is through a blood test called PSA, which stands for prostate specific antigen. And it's a screening test, meaning if the PSA is within an acceptable range, a guy doesn't need any further testing. But if the PSA level is higher than it should be, it oftentimes prompts a biopsy. And the biopsy itself, which is putting needles into the prostate, taking samples from the prostate, is ultimately what's needed to establish the diagnosis of prostate cancer. What are some of the known risks for prostate cancer? Yeah, so there are many risk factors for prostate cancer. The well-established ones are having a family history of prostate cancer. If you have brothers, uncles, fathers, grandfathers that have had the disease. Number two is men of African descent have a higher likelihood of being diagnosed with prostate cancer and also, unfortunately, a higher chance of dying from the disease. There are some lifestyle choices that have been associated with the diagnosis of prostate cancer. Dietary uh, information such as, you know, eating fruits and vegetables are thought to be good for prostate cancer, minimizing red meat. That is not well established, but there's ongoing trials and there's epidemiologic evidence looking at huge groups of men that at least suggest that that's uh, important to lower the risk of prostate cancer. And then there's a lot of emerging data on genetic risk. So unbeknownst to a lot of people, sometimes it's in your genes, even if you don't have necessarily a family history or you don't know your family history, but the most common gene that can cause prostate cancer is called the BRCA gene, which is BRCA which is best known for causing breast cancer, but unbeknownst to many people, if your family has the BRCA gene, it also places the men at higher risk of being diagnosed with prostate cancer. How do I find out if I have that gene? <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. And uh, the most common way it's done is if you or family members have had a history of prostate cancer or breast cancer, then there's genetic counselors and genetic testing that can be done. And it's as simple as a blood test or a cheek swab, and they can do testing on it. Additionally, there are also men who don't know their family history due to not communicating with them or adoption. And if they have an early diagnosis of prostate cancer at a young age or a particularly aggressive form of prostate cancer, it might be worthwhile talking to the docs about uh, getting tested for BRCA. When should men consider getting screened? What, um, who should be screened? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so it's a, a, a wildly controversial topic and we could talk for literally hours about it. Historically, no one was screened like I was talking about in the 1980s. Then PSA became available and at least in the United States, it was very common to be screened. And what we learned from that era was really intensive screening when people started at age 50, did it every year, uh, led to a lot of men being diagnosed with prostate cancer and being aggressively treated for it and saved a lot of lives. And that's the good news of intensive screening. And 50% fewer men are dying of prostate cancer in the U.S. But also with that approach, it led to literally millions of men being diagnosed with a prostate cancer, treated for a prostate cancer that was never going to cause them any problems during their natural lifespan. So... Now there's a whole spectrum of recommendations on who to screen when and how often. One side says 
if a man is going to live more than 10 years, consider starting screening somewhere between the ages of 45 and 50. To, you know, see what the prostate feels like, see what the PSA is, and based on that, determine, okay, does that man need to come back in one year, two years, a couple more years, know his family history, his ancestry. The other end of the spectrum is, which is from the U.S. government in about 2013, is since PSA screening can lead to unnecessary diagnosis and treatment, no one should be screened. Sort of the first do no harm philosophy. And so there's a lot being worked out through all the professional organizations and experts and guidelines to try to figure out sensibly. The American Urological Association, in my opinion, has a reasonably sensible approach where you know your family history. If you have a life expectancy greater than 10 years, at least discuss with your doctor getting your first PSA sometime around the age of 50. If you're of African descent or a strong family history, consider getting it in your 40s. Based on that, make future decisions, but probably need to be screened every other year rather than every year. Do you recommend patients be proactive in, in asking their doctor about it at like a physical or something, uh, no matter what age, or when should they even just start talking about it with their doc? Yeah, so I, I think it's good to be proactive with literally every health condition with your doctor. And when you go see your primary care doc, there's a lot of action going on and there's a lot of things that need to be covered. And so my personal opinion is when you get to the ages of 40 to 50, it's important to talk with your doc about screening for cancers, whether it's colon cancer, lung cancer if you're a smoker, prostate cancer. Make sure your doc knows your family history of what's going on, and that can certainly help inform you know, future decisions on screening. Okay, and, and just to stick with screening, and we talked about the PSA test. There's also the... DRE, Digital Rectal Exam. Just tell, tell everyone about what that is. Yeah, so the DRE stands for Digital Rectal Exam. Digital means digits of a finger. Mm -hmm. And it's a you know 15 to 20 second examination of the prostate where the doctor puts the finger in through the rectum and is able to feel the rectal canal as well as the prostate itself. And in my opinion and many others, it's still an important component of screening for prostate cancer because not all prostate cancers generate a lot of PSA and some of them can be diagnosed early and men can be effectively cured through the prostate examination. Now it's not commonly done anymore. Um, we personally think it's an important component. Okay. It also helps screen for rectal cancers. There's additional information if there's hemorrhoids or other issues. So I think it's important to at least consider. And does that go along with the PSA? Is that done typically together? Yeah, uh, we typically do it in tandem okay. at the same visit and in combination, those give us important information. And in fact, the digital rectal examination is the easiest and quickest way to determine the size of a man's prostate, which is also an important piece of information in how to interpret their PSA, how to integrate that with some symptoms they might be having and how to best help that man. And the, the PSA test, just, just to clear it up for the listeners, it's just a, a simple blood test. Is there anything else? Yep. Okay. A uh, simple blood test usually comes back the same day. There's even some technologies where it can come back on the spot in the okay. clinic. Um, okay. And there's, you know, some important pieces of information about the PSA. There's a lot of things that can impact your PSA. So the size of your prostate, whether you've had infections or inflammation, your prostate cancer risk profile goes into it. But what's really important to know is the PSA level itself can vary with time. So if you're found to have a PSA level that's higher than it should be, the first and most important thing is repeat it. If your doctor or you think you might have an infection causing the PSA to be high, it's worth doing a urine sample or some other specimens to see if that might be the cause. Um, but never act just on one single newly elevated PSA. You always want to repeat these things. And I usually repeat them a month or two down the road. And if it remains high, then we have a discussion on what to do about a high PSA. But many times it, you know, had bounced up and then returns back to what we would consider a normal level. Okay. And if you do have high PSA levels, what, what could that mean besides prostate cancer? Yeah, so PSA comes from the prostate 
and it is directly correlated to the chances of having prostate cancer. But one of the limitations of the PSA test is that men with very large prostates tend to generate PSA. So if you're screening for prostate cancer and you have a large prostate, oftentimes there's some noise, you know, obscuring the signal of the PSA. Other times infections of the prostate, you know, urinary tract infections, or something called prostatitis, which is inflammation of the prostate. The PSA can also go high if you've had a catheter or tube in your bladder recently, or you had a recent procedure. So there's a lot of things that can cause the PSA to be high, and it's important for your doctor and you to know about all those potential alternative causes. What are some of the known symptoms of prostate cancer? Yeah, oftentimes if prostate cancer starts causing symptoms, it tends to be a larger cancer with a lower potential cure rate. So there are men where urinary symptoms can be caused by a large prostate cancer. Unfortunately, there are still men who find out about their prostate cancer because they have bone pain or other systemic symptoms from metastatic prostate cancer. Most guys who have curable prostate cancer are diagnosed through the digital rectal exam or through the PSA test. Now the converse is also really important for men to know. Urinary symptoms in men, particularly as they age, are incredibly common. And most men with new urinary symptoms or even chronic urinary symptoms, it is not being caused by a prostate cancer and it can be caused by a variety of other reasons. Okay. And, and how is prostate cancer graded or staged? Yeah, so when there's samples or biopsies taken from the prostate, we have a system called the Gleason scoring system. And Don Gleason was a pathologist from many years ago who made the observation under the microscope that we can tell aggressiveness of prostate cancer. And the system as currently used is called the Gleason scoring system where it typically goes from a score of six to 10. Six is the least aggressive, 10 is the most aggressive. Relatively recently, there's been a movement amongst experts to try to modify that system to make it a little bit more user-friendly for the patients where the six to 10 system in essence will be converted into a Gleason grouping system that goes from one to five where five is the most aggressive, one is the least aggressive. It'll probably take some time before that transformation takes place, um, but that's the way we understand the uh, level of aggressiveness of prostate cancer. Okay, and if you just wanna go into some of the more common treatment options, I know it probably depends on what you know how aggressive the cancer is, but what are some of the more common treatment options for prostate cancer? Yeah, so, to give you some perspective on potential management options for men with prostate cancer, when a man comes to my office with a new diagnosis of prostate cancer, either diagnosed by us or more commonly by other physicians and they're coming for a second opinion, we set aside about 45 minutes in the clinic to thoroughly go through all the options. Now, it's incredibly important for men and their loved ones to know that many men newly diagnosed with prostate cancer can safely observe their prostate cancer because it has such a low risk of ever causing problems. And that strategy is called active surveillance. And the long-term results and outcomes are superb for certain men that have a small amount of a type of prostate cancer that is unlikely to ever cause problems. It requires monitoring and it requires a long discussion, but that's important for men to know about. On the flip side, if a man has been diagnosed with a prostate cancer, that might one day cause problems or is currently a threat to spreading elsewhere in the body, then what we talk about traditionally is either surgery to remove the prostate or radiation therapy to the prostate. And there are many different ways of doing that. Surgery most commonly is done through a robotic approach, which is laparoscopic. It can also be done through open surgery. And then radiation therapy, there's many different ways of radiating the prostate. There's radioactive seeds called brachytherapy, which is a one-time procedure. There's also a form of radiation where there's external beams focused on the prostate over six to eight weeks, where you get a dose of radiation every day, Monday through Friday. And that's either called IMRT most commonly, or there's a, a, a type called proton therapy. Okay. And after these treatments, Go into a little bit about what men can expect with life after prostate cancer. Yeah. 
So it's incredibly important if you're consider if you have a new diagnosis of prostate cancer to meet with someone who has expertise in prostate cancer and have a really meaningful thorough discussion on what management options are available. I always tell guys that the first fork in the road in the decision making process is is this a cancer that would benefit from being treated or can it be safely monitored? And if treatment is recommended, the outcomes and the expectations really depend on the quality and skill of either the surgeon or the radiation doctor. And every man's situation is unique. And the things that go into that, that counseling session and informing the man really depend on the age of the patient, their current quality of life from a urinary standpoint, an erection standpoint, what we know about their cancer, what type of treatments they're considering, who's going to be administering the treatments, the short summary is, with a skilled surgeon, most men who undergo surgery ultimately have return of normal urinary control and normal erections. However, based on a guy's age, health, what is known about their cancer, sometimes the estimated likelihood of return of normal function is altered based on that information. And quite frankly, for some men, Erections are a very high priority going into surgery, and for other men, it's a very low or relatively low priority. And this is all important information to appropriately counsel a guy. And do you ever get asked about fertility for men af after treatment? What, what kind of advice would you have for a man trying to still have children? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, the average age of a man being diagnosed with prostate cancer in the U.S. is in the upper 60s. And guys who are diagnosed with prostate cancer that ultimately have surgery, the average age is in the low 60s. Now, most, the overwhelming majority of men at that age are done fathering children. But we do have men. I have a guy in their, his upper 30s. We occasionally see guys in their 40s or 50s who are still interested in fathering children. If a man proceeds with treatment with surgery or radiation therapy, his natural ability to father children will be gone. However, if fathering children is important to him and his partner at that time, there are ways of banking sperm, preserving it so that it can be used in the future so that his natural sperm could father a child. Is there anything that you've noticed just dealing with this disease for as long as you have um, on some of the advice you might give for a patient um, or their family or their loved ones about the psychological effects of a diagnosis or any advice there? Yeah, it's incredibly important. So, and I'm glad you mentioned it because any diagnosis of a cancer can be a psychologic hit and lead to trauma. And I think it's incredibly important for men, their loved ones, their family, their friends, and their physicians to address this. We have done some research with some colleagues to show that men have a higher likelihood of being depressed at the time of their diagnosis and we need to do a better job of addressing those issues because their choices, their outcomes, and their long-term health, both mental and physical, really depends on us addressing it. Now, I think it's incumbent on the medical community to help and initiate those conversations, but it's also incredibly important for men and their loved ones to bring it up to their physician so that we can help. There are support groups, there are resources. And when a guy's diagnosed, oftentimes, once we have a meaningful conversation about the diagnosis, if it turns out to be one of these cancers that's unlikely to cause a long-term problem, oftentimes that immediately allays the anxieties, fears, and potential depression. And then there are other times where there's a more meaningful cancer or it's the first major medical problem for a guy where it's a really important issue that needs to be addressed and there are endless number of resources to address the mental health issues that are that these guys are coping with. All right. Again, our guest is Dr. Scott Egner of the University of Chicago. And just curious, what what was it that led you to get involved in this this part of medicine and in particular prostate cancer? Yeah, it's a great question and uh, one that I commonly get. When I entered medical school, I had no idea what a urologist was or what a urologist did. And going through medical school and seeing what all the different specialties did, I immediately took to urology because I knew that I wanted to be some form of cancer doctor. I really liked the practice that urologists had when they were urologic oncologists where they dealt with men and women 
uh, dealing with a newly traumatic experience, a diagnosis of cancer, oftentimes requiring surgery, oftentimes with excellent long-term results, and they tended to have long-term relationships with their patients where some surgeons sort of perform a surgery and send the patient on their way. In my opinion, part of the beauty and the special element of urologic oncology is we get to care for these patients at their time of immediate diagnosis when they're sort of at their lowest point, see them through the whole process, and hopefully see them through for many, many years ongoing and uh, get to live that process with them. What was it exactly that was about prostate in particular? Yeah, it, prostate cancer, the thing that attracted it to me is, number one, was incredibly common. Number two, the long-term relationship. Number three is all the unmet needs and potential research opportunities to try to make the landscape better from screening, prevention, more effective treatment, active surveillance, even in metastatic disease, trying to make the landscape better. And uh, that was really what set, up, set me off on the journey that I've been on for the past you know, 18 years in training and learning about prostate cancer and now taking care of guys, teaching and doing research on the topic. Just curious, is, is prostate cancer always going to start in the prostate or is there a chance that it starts somewhere and spreads to the prostate? Great question. So more than 99% of guys that have cancer within their prostate, it started in the prostate. There are very, very rare situations where other cancers can spread into the prostate. Well, I want to thank our guest today, Dr. Scott Egner, the University of Chicago prostate cancer expert and surgeon, and we appreciate having you on today. Thank you again. Yeah, thanks for having me, Casey. It's an important topic. For more information on prostate cancer, visit urologyhelp.org slash prostate cancer. This podcast has been brought to you by the Urology Care Foundation, the official foundation of the American Urological Association.